Welcome to this online lesson on recruitment in the early modern era. Armies, 1500 to 1700, did recruitment become more professional? The aims today are to know how armies changed between 1500 and 1640, to explain how recruitment and training became more effective, and to evaluate the effectiveness of these training changes. As a key word, let's consider the word professional. We'll be revisiting this in future lessons too. In the main, this is defined as doing something as a main, a paid job, or being an expert at something. As a teacher, I consider myself a professional, well, most of the time, because I am trained as a historian, and I am doing it as my main job, and despite my love of it, I would need to be paid to carry on doing it. That makes me a professional. Can you think of any other examples of professional jobs? When we move on, we're going to have a look at the earlier type of training and recruitment that was in use during the Tudor period in the time of Henry VII, Henry VIII, and later Tudor monarchs. Let's see. Tudor recruitment, the militia. In the times of Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, England needed armies to defend itself against enemies such as France, Spain, and Scotland, as well as internal rebellions. Here's how the system developed. Firstly, the militia. Local people were expected to provide their own weapons, the type depended on their wealth, if they were called on by the king for a war. This is similar to the assize of arms system in the Middle Ages, where it was usually the practice that people of military age would keep weapons at home, and that might be a simple musket, some simple armour, or perhaps a pole arm such as a spear or pike. Alternatively, communities might club together to equip these men if they couldn't afford the cost themselves. The men in the picture show people equipped in a typical way for this period. Secondly, the general muster. The militia would gather every two years to have their equipment checked by the Lord Lieutenant. The Lord Lieutenant would inspect this and any problems would be dealt with there and then. However, this was not particularly frequent. Also, there was pressing. Pressing is the dark side of recruitment at this time. The militia couldn't serve abroad, and so few would volunteer for wars overseas. Therefore, men in the army were usually pressed, forced to fight abroad. This was very unpopular. This could be done at either musket point, or simply by getting to them to agree to something while they were drunk or otherwise indisposed, and whisking them off before they knew what was going on. Lastly, let's have a look at some tasks. Note down definitions for these three key terms, the militia, the general muster, and pressing. Why would this system not produce quality soldiers? I'm sure some of them had some talents, but overall the quality of armies and their training was low in this period. Thirdly, and as a challenge, how might a Tudor monarch improve upon this system? That's what we'll be looking at next. Have a go at these tasks, pause the video and press play when you're ready to continue. Done? Well, let's consider the quality of these soldiers. Consider first of all that the general muster only happened once every two years. If the army was called up between those points, the quality of the weapons and the soldiers might decline quite substantially. Secondly, pressing. Men who are pressed or forced to fight are unlikely to be the most motivated men and are unlikely to want to stay around. If they get the chance to, to desert or run away, they probably will. So, let's consider the ways in which Tudor monarchs did in fact attempt to improve this system. The main way that this was improved was what was, were called the trained bands. Anyone who served abroad to, could expect not to come home again. Around 90% of men who served abroad might die of starvation, shipwreck, disease, or simply desert and run away and never be seen again. As well as, of course, die in battle. The old system needed updating. Here's how they did it. Firstly, the trained bands. These were introduced in 1573. That's a key date, so make sure you get it down. A proportion of the men from each county would meet once a month in summertime to train under the direction of a professional muster master. Summertime really relates to the campaigning season when military service was most likely. It's also one of the slacker times for the agricultural labourers. It was between the planting and the ploughing and the harvest at the end of the summer and the beginning of the autumn. So an ideal time to take men away for training. Your task then, in what ways are the trained bands more effective than militia? I'll give you a chance to answer this question now. Pause the video and press play when you're ready to continue. Done? 
Well, hopefully we've recognised that the muster master is inspecting these men once a month during summertime rather than once every two years. It's actually a more formal uh, system of training as well. However, it wasn't perfect. Have a look at this source. A historian describes the views of Ward. Ward was a muster master from 1639 in the Stuart period. This is from a book that was published in 1992. According to Ward, the chief thing that the trained bands learnt was to drink. Whenever they got met near a great town, many of the men would slip away and stay in the inns and taverns tippling, which means drinking, when they should be exercising in the field. The god they worshipped in their trainings, as another writer put it, was not war, but wine. All right, let's consider what's going on here. We have to remember that compared to our own lives, uh, these men led, led lives that were not especially interesting. They were not especially varied either. These uh, training trips to the Master Master would have been a welcome change of pace and also a bit of an opportunity for the lads to get together. And, without getting too stereotypical, when you get a load of young men together and they're away from their wives and their families, they might have the propensity to misbehave, especially if they're not being particularly well supervised. And so, when the train bands would meet, very often they were meeting up with friends that they saw once a month and they would get absolutely blind drunk rather than doing anything very useful. I'm sure not all the trained band bands were like this, but unless the Muster Master was a particularly strong character, you could see it happening. That brings us on to our next task. Read the source. What discipline problems are there? And B, what might explain this lack of discipline? Take a couple of minutes to answer that question in a few sentences. Pause the video and press play when you're ready to continue. Done? Well, hopefully we, we recognise that these men were not necessarily training hard. They were going to the inns and drinking. And that drunkenness, we might infer, would lead to further disor disorder such as fighting. And not the fighting for war that they were expected to be training for. Um, what might explain this? Well, again, remember the age of these men. Remember the fact that they are all men. Remember the fact that their lives were really quite boring and uh, were so routine that any break from that routine would have been seen as a real treat. Uh, they're away from their families. They're often away from their local communities as well, which also would have been quite rare at this time. So there are many, many reasons why discipline might break down under the trained band system. Let's move on. We're going to look now at the culmination of this type of recruitment in a very major conflict called the English Civil War. What you're going to produce is a series of quick notes. You're going to note down who was involved, why did the war start, where were the key battles, when did it happen and what were the results. I'm going to give you the information and you can take a moment or two to make those notes. For the purposes of this lesson you really don't need to know much more about the English Civil War although you could easily have an entire topic on it in, on its own. It's a very significant event, and uh, I'll give you a brief rundown of it now. So very simply, this is a war over who should have power between King Charles and his royalist or cavalier supporters, and Parliament and their parliamentarian or roundhead supporters. Charles I believed that God had made him king, so he didn't have to listen to the advice of others. He called this the divine right of kings. This brought him into conflict with Parliament, who demanded power in return for raising taxes for the king. As a result, Charles I tried to arrest five members of Parliament by entering the House of Commons. This was illegal. Uh, you might notice at the state of, of Parliament today, the Queen is not allowed in the House of Commons and has to send one of her agents, Black Rod, to open it for her. Uh, traditionally, Black Rod has the door slammed in his or her face and has to knock to enter. It's a little hangover from what happened back there in 1642. Anyway, I digress. Both sides raised armies, and the fighting and chaos that ensued became proportionally the bloodiest war in, in British history. It's a bit of good pub quiz knowledge, that. Many people suppose that the First World War was the deadliest war in English history, uh, and in fact, by the number of people who died, that would be true. However, proportionally, so as a percentage of the population, the English Civil War was a lot more deadly. Most of the fighting was in England, and key battles included Edge Hill in 1642, Marston Moor in 1644, Naseby in 1645, and Great Torrington in 1646. All right, I might have shown a bit of bias here. Great Torrington was a later battle that most people don't know about, but it happens to be my hometown, so I'm going to include it. By 1646, Parliament's armies, led by Oliver Cromwell and Thomas Fairfax, had beaten Charles and placed him under arrest. He was later put on trial for treason, found guilty and beheaded. 
Ever since, Parliament has had more power than the monarch. All right, spend a few moments putting in together your quick notes now. Uh, make sure that you include specific details and you make them as detailed as you possibly can do. Pause the video now and press play when you're ready to continue. OK, hopefully you've got everything you need now. Let's look at an early example of these sorts of armies. In Civil War armies were organised into regiments of foot, this means infantry, and horse, this means the cavalry. Here they are. By the end of the war in 1646, the parliamentarians had built up a, a professional force called the New Model Army. This was led by Sir Thomas Fairfax and Oliver Cromwell. But before this time, the militia system was more in place, and in particular, the train band system was more in place. And both sides relied on pressing their men into service. It wouldn't have been particularly unusual for someone to fight for each side in the Civil War at various times if they were a seasoned and experienced soldier. Now, on the next few slides, I'm going to be showing you some images that I drew back in my teacher training. So I hope that they're of acceptable quality to you. We're going to look at the equipment that they had. We're going to look at their tactics and what type of soldier was effective at beating what other type of soldier. This will inform us about the tactics of the Civil War era and how these men were trained. It's more simple than you'd expect. Firstly, the cavalry. I've drawn this as a typical parliamentarian cavalryman, although most cavalry were equipped quite similarly throughout the war. The cavalry was armed by with a sword and two pistols. I've mentioned that the pistols only had one shot each. Of course, they could be reloaded, but this could not be done in the saddle as it was such a fiddly job. Instead, the pistols were there for blasting at people who the cavalry couldn't get to and to try and blast their way out of harm's way if they got a bit surrounded. They were really quite well armoured for the time. Although the armour wouldn't have stopped a musket ball, it was effective armour against short sword strokes and axes. Armoured with a lobster tail helmet, that's that flap on the back of the helmet which rested over the neck protecting it and rose up and down with the mo movement of the horse. Also had a light breastplate of body armour and heavy leather jerkins and trousers and boots to prevent sword slashes on those vulnerable areas too. It wasn't unusual for cavalrymen to have an iron gauntlet on their left hand, which would have been holding the reins of the horse. The horse itself provided great speed and mobility. Remember, there was nothing else on the battlefield that was as fast as the horse. So, what about their strengths and weaknesses? Well, the cavalry can attack foot soldiers as long as they are not equipped with long spears and pikes, and they could also attack other cavalry. When attacking other cavalry, numbers, training and discipline were usually what counted in, in turning the tide. However, they cannot win against organised pike or spear formations, for reasons that should become clear when we have a look at the pikemen's equipment. Under the heading cavalry, make any relevant notes that you need to now, and then move on when you're ready. Pause the video now, and then press play when you're ready to carry on. OK, so we've had a look at the cavalry. Let's see who's next. Muskets. Musketeers had no armour. First of all, this was for their comfort and for their mobility, and also because if they were facing other musketeers, it was really quite pointless. The armour would not have protected them. Most musketeers of the English Civil War were armed with a matchlock musket. We've already seen the operation of these if you've seen my video on gunpowder weapons. The range of the matchlock musket was around 100 metres, although it should be said that the accurate range of this was much, much lower than that. At 100 metres, you probably had only a 10% chance of hitting a man-sized target, or possibly even less. The matchlock musket was very slow to load. Each bullet took between 20 and 30 seconds to load, and that's if you were well-trained and not panicking. That thing in his hand that looks a little bit like a cigarette is in fact the burning match cord, always held in the left hand so that it wouldn't accidentally set off the gunpowder charge at the base of the musket. They carry small bottles of gunpowder, each one was pre-loaded with a charge of gunpowder sufficient for firing one musket ball. So, what about their strengths and weaknesses? Musketeers can attack foot soldiers at a distance. So they can shoot at other musketeers, but if they're in range of musketeers, then they themselves are within range of their enemy. Musketeers are much better at uh, shooting at advancing pikemen and other soldiers in heavy armour. Their muskets will be able to shoot through that armour, and if they get too close, because they are more lightly equipped, they can simply retire to a safer distance and carry on shooting. However, they are very weak and vulnerable against the cavalry. These muskets only being able to find one or two shots a minute mean that 
even if you get one shot off at the cavalry, you're not going to kill them all. So by the time you finish reloading your gun uh, after that, the cavalry will simply run you down and lop your head off. Instead, cavalrymen in, uh, in this situation would pick on musketeers, and musketeers would rely on turning their muskets around and trying to use them as a basic club to defend themselves. But usually there was only one winner in that situation, the cavalry. Now, like you did for the cavalrymen, make any notes that you want to. Then when you're ready, press play and we'll continue. Finally, we're going to look at the pikemen. Oh, but before we do, let's have a look at this. This is a typical soldier's mould uh, from the English Civil War period. Musket balls would be moulded by soldiers in the field. Some versions of this could mould more than one ball at a time. Notice, though, that in the centre of the mould, there's a little thing that looks like wire cutters. This was for snipping off the sprues or mould marks on the musket balls, and you can see those little bumps on the end of the musket balls themselves. However, these were not tight-fitting projectiles within the gun, and so these little imperfections did not affect them. Instead, the inaccuracy of the weapon was uh, partly down to the fact that the bullets or, or balls would bounce as they came out of the barrel of the gun. But it did make it very easy for soldiers to supply themselves with ammunition. Lead was more readily available than you might think. There are even reports of, sold, of armies marching through towns and finding the leaded windows of churches and other houses and taking the, that lead, melting it down and making it into musket balls. Now the pikeman. He's well armoured with a helmet, a backplate and a breastplate. Often they would have, flap, have flaps called tassets over their legs as well, although these some, were sometimes dispensed with as they were cumbersome and got in the way without providing a huge amount of extra protection. The helmet style is called a morion. It's got a high crest on it, which provides a little bit of extra protection uh, against sword strokes and axe strokes coming from above. The pikemen were by far the heaviest armoured um, uh, infantry and soldiers on the Civil War battlefield. Now, when I originally drew this pikeman on an A4 piece of paper, I ran out of space. So, the pike was 16 feet long, that's 5 metres long in new money, and tipped with a long steel spike. I've drawn the end of the pike behind the pikeman here. They're also armed with a small sword called a tuck. This could be used as a secondary weapon if their pike um, broke or if they got into a position where they were alone and unable to use the pike. That's the thing with the pikes. They're so unwieldy that you had to use them in combination with other soldiers for them to be effective. You might benefit as well from reminding yourself about the pike Schiltron formations from much earlier. In the battles of Stirling Bridge in 1297 and indeed at uh, Falkirk in 1298, the Scots used pike Schiltrons. Now, although the Scots were beaten with their pikes at, uh, at Falkirk in 1298, the pike remained an important anti-cavalry weapon, and that's the point that the Scots proved way back in 1297 at Stirling Bridge. So, let's go on to their strengths and weaknesses. They are very effective defence against cavalry. When in formation with multiple layers of pikes all pointing at the cavalry, the horses simply cannot get through. The horses with a sense of self-preservation will simply shy away, at which point the cavalry can be shot by muskets working with the pikemen, or the pikes can advance and stab the horses. They can defend the muskets, therefore, and by using these two soldiers in combination can be very effective. However, these are very slow formations. In order to stay tightly packed together, in order to manoeuvre their long and unwieldy pikes, and in order to, be, uh, to remain disciplined, they need to move slowly. This can make them very vulnerable to musket fire. Most pike formations would struggle to advance across the battlefield at anything more than a reasonably slow walk, giving the muskets plenty of time to shoot at their leisure and retire if the pikes get too close. So really, what we've got now is a combination of pikes, muskets and cavalry that, when used in the correct combinations, dictate the tactics of the battlefield. Take a moment to take any notes that you'd like to about the pikemen, and then we'll move on. Pause the video now. OK, hopefully you've got everything now. Let's review the tactics. English Civil War tactics were very similar to a game that many of you will have played before. Rock, paper, scissors. In the game of rock, paper, scissors, each move can defeat one other move, but is defeated by the third. Let's take the rock, for example. The rock blunts the scissors, but can be wrapped by the paper. Then the paper. The paper can be cut by the scissors, but it can wrap the rock. And then finally the scissors. The scissors can cut the paper, but are blunted by the rock, and so forth. 
we can apply this to English Civil War tactics. If we take the pikemen, the pikemen can beat the cavalry, but are in turn beaten by the muskets. The cavalry can beat the muskets, but in turn are beaten by the pikes. And the muskets can beat the pikes, but are in turn beaten by the cavalry. So, if in a civil war battle situation you saw an isolated group of musketeers, you could send your cavalry to effectively defeat them. Equally, you could use your pikemen to set up a defensive formation to defend against the cavalry, and so forth. It really was as simple as that, or at least it was while discipline remained and whilst things were clear. Once the blood, smoke and noise of battle happened, confusion was far more likely. We're going to look at a real example of that next. Let's consider the quality of army and armies and leaders at the start of the English Civil War. On the next slide, you will see what happened af at the first battle of the English Civil War. On the 23rd of October, 1642, 30,000 men and 5,000 men with horses, these are the cavalry, met at a place called Edge Hill. The whole argument between King and Parliament was meant to be settled in an afternoon, but it wasn't. Your task then is going to be to observe what happened and be ready to give your opinion as to why nobody won the Battle of Edge Hill. Let's have a look at what happened that day. Here we see the armies of King Charles in blue. The armies of Parliament under the Earl of Essex are shown in red. Don't think that this is anything about uniforms though. Although Parliament later on had a red uniform, at this time they were simply using a field sign of a simple orange sash and the King's units had their own field sign as well. It could have been quite confusing. By way of a key, our units are divided up as follows. The blocks, or rectangles, are our pike blocks. There would have been several hundred men at least to each of these symbols. Similarly, the muskets are shown as triangles in between them. The cavalry are shown as these chess pieces, or knights. And lastly, the dragoons. These are circles. Yes, that's dragoons, not dragons. Don't be thinking about Game of Thrones here. The dragoons fought very much like musketeers, except they arrived on horseback. This gave them greater uh, use as scouts and also use as skirmishers. They could get into a fight and then leap on their horses and escape if it all got a bit too much for them. But don't think that they fought like cavalry. This was very rare and not something that they were trained for. The battle itself happened uh, at Edge Hill, which itself is a hill, uh, between the villages of Radway and Kyneton. The king took up the stronger position and had the larger army at Edge Hill. However, neither side had much experience of war. The only truly experienced person there that day was Prince Rupert of the Rhine, nephew to King Charles, and he was relying on Prince Rupert to demonstrate to the men how fighting should be done. So let's see what happened. Well, for the king, it didn't start brilliantly. Prince Rupert charged the Parliamentarian cavalry without having actually been ordered to. One can only imagine King Charles's reaction to this. As a result, the ironically named Sir Faithful Fortescue on the Parliamentarian side swiftly took off his field sign and change side. The rest of his men panicked and understandably fled the battlefield. So what should Prince Rupert do at this point? Well what he should do is return to the king's lines and uh, wait to coordinate the next attack. Instead he dashed through the lines and looted Kyneton with his men. They played no further part in the battle. Their overconfidence is what resulted in much of the king's losses. Then Sir Henry Wilmot charged the left line of Parliament's army, and again Parliament's badly led uh, cavalry ran away. Unlike Prince Rupert, though, Sir Henry Wilmot returned to his lines. This was a much wiser idea. Sensing victory, Charles sent in his main army, but this was a bad move as he should have stayed on the hill really and challenged Parliament to advance towards him. Now here on the map you might see why this is actually a bit more of a stalemate. Although Charles outnumbered Parliament's men, he did not match his soldiers particularly well against each other. And in particular, the, the musketeers in the Earl of Essex's centre began to do very heavy damage to the pikemen ranged against them. Both sides began to panic. It's at this point that the Earl of Essex sent the dragoons around the back to attack the royalist army. Being shot at from behind and sensing that cavalry were about to outflank them, the royalists panicked. But so did the parliamentarians. Such was the inexperience of both sides. Edge Hill finished after a few hours of stalemate with both sides withdrawing. 
neither side was e able to keep its nerve and show sufficient leadership to win. Oh dear. What this means is that the Battle of Edge Hill of 1642 was indecisive. Nobody won it. And yet with better leadership, both sides had opportunities where they could have won. Let's consider that further. So why were leaders so important? Taking the example of the Battle of Edge Hill, bad leadership and poor training is the reason that the war went on in the, in the first place. If it had been settled that afternoon, perhaps it would have been a much shorter war. Parliament didn't know how to control a battle, but then neither did Charles. Prince Rupert, while a good soldier, was more interested in stealing than winning. So your final question today is as follows. Consider what we've learned about the militia and the trained bands. This is how the men were trained at the Battle of Edge Hill. Consider two features of poor training and leadership at the Battle of Edge Hill in 1642. Describe them and then explain why leaders are so important. Next lesson we'll have a look at the new model army that sought to address some of these shortcomings. Once you've finished this task, that's the end of the video, the end of the lesson, and I'll say thank you very much. If it's been helpful, please like and subscribe to the channel, and I'll speak to you again soon. Goodbye.